<laughs> Good morning. <laughs> and do well, we do welcome you to Sunday morning service for the Calvary Braid Valley. And um, we are starting a new, uh, a new book. It'll short book. It's one chapter. Um, we've broken down into three sections. Uh, it's the book of Jude. Jude's a little little book that is it the book before Revelation? If you guys found it in there, yes, it is. I thought so. So you know, it's hidden in there, in that difficult to find. But once you get there, there's some real gems and some real great stuff here. Um, the the um, theme of the book and the title for our time through through June is earnestly contend for the faith. And today we'll be in verses one through seven, and. Uh, the first of the three things that we'll be contending for today will be contending for the heart. Uh, so let's pray. So Father, we ask your blessings upon these ancient words, upon the words of Jude and Lord, make them alive, living as they are, powerful, working into our hearts. And Lord, let these words have an impact in our lives today. And we ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So the theme of the book of Jude is what we've titled um, this uh, series. Uh, Jude writes in, in verse 3, I found it necessary to write to you to contend for the faith. To contend means to fight for. It's to fight for it and defend. So I'm appealing to you to fight for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And so, uh, the book of Jude begins with um, where we get the title and tells us who wrote it. The very first word of this book is the name of the author. As it begins in the first verse, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So, this tells us a little bit more, not only who it was, what his name was, but who. He was. And so I asked the question, who is Jude? Who was this man who describes himself as a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James? Now, James is uh, the, the James who became the head of the church in Jerusalem. James was Jesus's half-brother. James and his brother Jude were raised in the family, in, in Jesus's family. Their parents were Mary and Joseph. <laughs> so that's why we call them the half-brothers of, of uh, Jesus. And James very quickly, very early on, became sort of the head, the leader of the Christians, the first church in Jerusalem. In that church were all were the other um, eleven surviving apostles that Jesus picked, but James is called an apostle himself. We read in the in the book of Galatians that Paul says, "You know, I spent some time in Jerusalem with uh, James the apostle, who was the head of the church." So um, James is an apostle. Jude, this Jude is an apostle as well too. Hence, his writing, his book, is in the canon, the collection of the Word of God. But like I said, um, and, and you look at James, and he does not call himself an apostle. He calls himself the same thing that Jude called himself, a servant of Jesus Christ. But um, this servant is... We are all, all Christians, all believers, are servants of the Lord. We serve the Lord. But he's using this in a, in a way as one called into ministry, one called into service. So he's a called servant of the Lord, like his brother James was. And it's interesting with the, with the family. Uh, we know that James and our, your man here, Jude, was in the family of Jesus because 
It says so in, in the Gospels, um, like Mark 6, 3, which the people, he was back to his hometown in Nazareth, and the people just couldn't get their heads around Jesus that they knew that they grew up with, coming back and teaching all these amazing things about God and doing amazing miracles and all this. And they kind of scoffed at him and said, uh, uh, we, we know Jesus, he's, he's a nobody. It says, isn't this not uh, the carpenter? We know Jesus, he's just a guy that works with his hands making wooden, wooden things. He's the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph, which is Joseph in uh, English, and Judas, which is Jude, a man here, and Simon. So there was, Jesus had four brothers, and it says, and are not his sisters with us? So Jesus was raised with four other brothers and sisters too. And it says the people of Nazareth took offense at him, at Jesus. Because, you know, he's just a common guy. He's just one of us, you know. And during the Lord Jesus' ministry, his own family did not believe in him. James, who became the leader of the church in Jerusalem and wrote the, the book of James, was one, it says, uh, for it says in John 7, verse 5, not even his brothers believed in him. So, um, you know, Jude very quickly, and James, and all the brothers, I'm sure, too, very quickly after the Lord uh, died and was resurrected, maybe even before he ascended uh, back to heaven, came to faith and followed. They believed. How tough it would be to think that your brother, you know, how would you guys think if, if all of a sudden Cain comes in, comes back into town and says, Oh, by the way, guys, I'm the long-awaited Messiah that we've all hoped for, you know, and, and he works miracles and says, follow me, you know, do what I do, and it's the only way you can come to God. You guys would probably feel the same way as the rest of his brothers did. It's like, we know Cain. He couldn't possibly be the Messiah. So they said, you know, they knew Jesus, and he was the Messiah. And as they think back, I go, you know, he never really did anything wrong, did he? It was so annoying. <laughs> Turns out he was sinless and lived among us just like a normal guy. You know, so, uh, you know, that's pretty amazing. But those guys, Jude and James, didn't take it. They could very easily have said, well, you know, you know, I'm the brother of Jesus. They didn't use that. They just said, I'm a servant of, I'm a servant of Jesus. And as we read in this book of Jude, he realizes who Jesus is, the Son of God. And that Jesus is not is equal with God, the Son of God, the second part of the Trinity, God Himself, and He'll He'll say, we'll see that today in a little bit, you know. But as far as Jude Himself, we don't know any more of His history, other than what little bits we have in this book. Jude evidently kind of hung out with Peter, because this book of Jude. And especially Second Peter, a lot of similarities. So some portions of it are word for word with each other. Um, some that we'll, we'll see today. So kind of interesting. But we really know very, very, very little about your man Jude here who wrote this. So the book of Jude was written by an apostle, one who was a servant, a leader in the, in the church, follower of Jesus, a believer in Jesus. Um, and who is this book written to? It was written to believers. Um, and um, it says this, he was written to those who are fellow servants with him. And it says this in the second half of the first verse, you know, uh, Jude, uh, as he starts out with the first word, to those who are called, beloved, or sanctified, in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Which, I think, this is a great description of what a Christian is. Now, 
If you're reading different versions of the Bible, this part of the verse probably reads differently. Um, depending, anyway, I don't want to go into detail or, or bore you with the with the little bits, but you know, there, there's uh, you know two basic uh, sources of the Greek manuscript that we have to translate into English. Uh, the, the majority text and the what I call Byzantine or Alexandrian texts, which are older but questionable. Some think that just because they're older, they must be better, but there's, I, I don't know if they're as reliable. Uh, and uh, modern ones, so like King James used uh, one. And so in King James, New King James, and other ones that follow that, instead of saying beloved, which is agape, loved, it says sanctified. And I think that's, I mean, both are true. I mean, I think sanctified is the more um, accurate one to be used here. So I'm going to use sanctified for this description. So I think this is great. So um, a, a great description of Christians, someone who is sanctified, being kept by Jesus and, and called by Jesus. Now I say it in that way and go, wait a minute, you didn't do it in the order that it's called. <laughs> Greek's funny language. And it's tough to translate from the Greek into English because um, it, it just, if you go straight across so many ways, it just would not sound right to, to our ears. And so the word um, placement in this, in this sentence has been changed when he translated into English to better understand. But in the original, the words were placed in that order. For those who are sanctified, kept, and called um, by Jesus in that. So I'm going to go that way, and I think that's a, it's a great thing. So we have these words. First one, sanctified. It, what does this big fancy word mean? <laughs> it means to be made holy, to be set apart, set away. When um, we believe in the Lord, when we put faith in Jesus, uh, his death on the cross and that, we believe that he died for our sins, he sanctifies us. He makes us holy in his sight. So he, God, when he looks at every believer, he chooses to see the believer as sanctified, as someone who is holy. And isn't that a beautiful thing? So the first thing we are is changed. Changed on the inside and changed in God's eyes. How does God see us this way? That's what we call grace. God giving and doing for us what we cannot do ourselves. No person can make themselves holy. Because what, it, what does it mean to be holy? It means to be without sin, to be forgiven of sin. So when, when God forgives us through our faith in Jesus, we are made holy. We are sanctified. It also means sanctified means set apart for use. So we're not just made holy in his eyes. He says, you know, these are, are my children. These are, these are the ones I'm going to use. God himself can use you for his work. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And I could go on and on and on about that. <laughs> but it's wonderful. And um, secondly, Christians have been sanctified. And Christians are are being kept by the Lord Jesus. And this word kept means kept. It means to be, to be kept. It means to keep. It means to, to guard from loss, protect, and prevented from being taken away. Guarded would be, you know, God stands, stands on guard 
for your soul, the soul of all of his children, to keep you in him. And that's a wonderful thing. God keeps us, and we keep ourselves. It's, it, it works together. You know, we, God, we can trust God to keep us, but we also want to keep ourselves and following him and doing what um, pleases him and obeys him. This word kept, uh, we'll see again in just a few verses in a whole different way. But, you know, Jesus commits himself to keep us in him, in faith. And finally, in the, in, in the Greek sentence, in the words, this, this term for being called, every Christian is called. Um, and as one uh, Greek expert says, uh, this word is placed at the end of the sentence for emphasis. And it's a really great thought. Um, called is used in, in the way of being invited. You remember the story that Jesus told, the parable of the king that invited people to a banquet, invited people to come, you know, all you can eat, you know, the best of the best. Uh, that's that w word called. Same thing. God calls us to his banqueting table through Jesus. And we are personally invited to eternal life by being called by God himself. So aren't these beautiful, wonderful things and a great description of what a Christian is? Someone who was sanctified. Someone who was kept by God himself. Someone who has been called. Yeah, praise the Lord, it's beautiful. And this term called is a really comforting, comforting word. One of, um, one of my favorite uses of, of this word, and it's not just called. So we who are called are known as the called. And we see this in Romans 8, verse Oops, what I do? Verse 30, um, which says, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. Remember, justified is to be forgiven of sin, to be declared innocent, and it becomes justified, had never sinned. It goes along with sanctified, doesn't it? These big fancy words, but they have simple and meaning deep meaning. So those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. So Christians are sanctified, justified, glorified, kept, called. Ah, that's great. Another comforting verse is also from Romans 8 about the called uh, that, that occurs just a couple verses earlier. And this is from the New King James translation. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So not only are Christians set apart, made holy in special relationship with God, but God is working in our lives to work all things together for good those who love God and those who are the called. So Jude's getting us off to a good start, a really comforting start. And you know his brother James, you read the book of James and oh my goodness, James was an exhorter. He was the preacher man. He was, you know, fiery, um, fiery preacher. We get, get his brother Jude here is a little bit different. You know, we, we see this. While James was an exhorter, Jude here is being an encourager, encouraging us in our faith, encouraging us in, in our life, encouraging us in life. You know, and especially by what we, his heart for his audience, the believers, as we see in verse 2. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. 
I like that. Multiplied, not just added to, but multiplied, you know, more and more and more of these, you know, and these three, I see really uh, complement the three uh, words he used to describe the Christian. Um, so <coughs> multiplied mercy comes from being called. God in his mercy has called us. Uh, multiplied peace comes from knowing that we are being kept in faith by him. And multiplied love comes from being sanctified. So in, in, in many of the newer translations, they use one where instead it says sanctified, it uses love. And it still works together. Out of love, he has sanctified us. He sanctified us because we're loved. And may that love, may that peace, may that mercy be multiplied to all of us. Be multiplied to us all. And that is my prayer. That's my blessing for you that we be multiplied in, in these wonderful things because of that. Well, why did Jude write this book? The third verse tells us why. And it is a surprise. This book took a different turn from what he expected. Because we read in verse 3, Beloved, Although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to earnestly contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So, although Jude wanted to write an easy letter, you know, he wanted to write, you know, an encouraging, a comforting letter, a supportive letter, something that doesn't ruffle feathers or, or make waves. He couldn't. The Holy Spirit impressed on him uh, to take on a difficult topic instead. A topic that would have a reaction that's not smooth and easy. And the result of Jude obeying God, obeying the Spirit's call, was this book which is part of the inspired Word of God. So sometimes we might purpose in our mind to, to do something to go an easy route, but then things may stir up. We may be led to do into something that we don't want to, that causes us to, to you know, our, our tummies to get in knots and to be nervous and anxious about, you know, what God is leading us to. But when we obey him, oh my goodness, just like the results for Jude, it makes things so much better. You know, so it's not, uh, do I have a quote from Wearsby here? Okay, I'll get to that in a bit. Um, uh, and so, great results when you follow God's path, even though it's not really what you want to do but it's much better to do what he wants us to do than uh, what we want to do. And we always want the easy path, the easy way, you know? So, oh Lord, I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to talk to that person. I can't stand that person. He can't stand me. <clears throat> you know, so, and who knows what blessings come as we obey and do what we would really rather not. <laughs> Um, Warren Wiersbe wrote uh, something cool. He said, uh, I would much rather encourage the saints than declare war on the apostates, as Jude has done here. But when the enemy is in the field, the watchmen dare not go to sleep. <laughs> so Jude was an apostle. He was a servant. He was a leader in the church. He was a pastor. Uh, he cared about the people. And so he knew there's a there's some people here we need to take on. We need to make you be aware of and things to do. In other words, to uh, you need to earnestly contend or fight for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, that word contend, or as the New King James puts it, earnestly contend, 
is a very strong word used only once in the New Testament. It's a word that describes the training of the Olympic athletes. And in this word, we get the English word agonize from. Um, and so uh, the, this word speaks of a vigorous, intense, determined struggle to defeat the opposition. Uh, so it's a, a perfect word, but not an easy word. He's calling us to the next level. He says, uh, fight for the faith, contend for the faith. And what is the faith? The faith is um, uh, the belief, uh, the doctrine, the teachings of the apostle, of the Bible. And that's where we get the faith. What are we, what are we to believe? Uh, what are we to know? That is the faith. And that's found only in the Bible. And who are to do it? The saints. Now, who are the saints? The saints are simply, it's not just a football team in New Orleans. <laughs> the saints are um, the believers. Saints means simply set apart ones. So those who have been sanctified by faith in Jesus, set apart, are called by that. Saints, and that's what the word saint means. It's a term for every born-again believer, a term for everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus and trusts him for salvation. And it's the faith that was once for all delivered. Not what was formerly there, but what was finally there, once for all. Uh, as one old uh, commentator said, no other faith will be given. It's once for all. Uh, and a, a, a Greek expert uh, has a version of the Bible and he translates this little term this, that we have said, contend with intensity and determination for the faith, for all entrusted into the safe keeping of the saints. For that word delivered means that, entrusted for safekeeping to us who believe. Now, that's what we are to contend for. Um, who are we to contend against? Those who do not live right while claiming to be Christian leaders or Christian followers. In other words, those who don't have the right heart for God. Hence, I called this message, Contending for the Heart. We read in verse 4, For certain people have crept... Oh, oh I forgot that. I, I avoided that. Contending for the people. Okay. Okay, now, verse 4. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Who are these certain people? People so professed leaders in the Christian church who wanted to have others follow them. Jude's not the only one that goes after these certain people. Uh, Peter lets them have it. James um, Solomon <laughs> in the Old Testament and probably others. So these, these are people that are very displeasing to God. People who are ungodly. Uh, ungodly people. Ungodly means without awe, without the reverential awe of the Lord. In other words, those who are not what we call God-fearing. Don't follow him. And what do they do? They pervert the grace of God. And I was talking with Zach the other day, and we were talking about grace and, and against legalism and stuff. And some Christian ministers and that are kind of afraid of grace, thinking that, wow, if it's just grace, you know, we can't 
don't have control over the people, what they might do. And if uh, people may pervert grace, God's um, undeserved kindness, which is what results in our holiness and sanctification, um, pervert that grace into bad living. In other words, take grace. You say, well, I'm under grace. God, you know, you know, God has saved me. God has chosen me. God keeps me. So I can do whatever I want, and it's all right. You know, I can live sinfully. I can live after the flesh. And it's all right because of grace. That's perverting the grace of God. And that's what these certain people were doing. And they were unbelieving. Oh, they said they were believers, but they were really unbelieving because they were denying uh, Jesus and uh, rejecting him as Lord and Master. These are certain people were false teachers who crept in unnoticed. As another, uh, as another uh, uh, old commentator puts it, they uh, slipped into the pulpit by a side door. <laughs> If perverting doctrine, doctrines are the teachings of the faith. As uh, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 6, 3, about those who would pervert doctrine, teach and pervert the faith, he says, if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit, and understands nothing. How do you really feel, Paul? So <laughs> there you have it. Um, so now to end our section, Jude gives three examples from the Old Testament of, of uh, people who had been redeemed or um, angels who had been set apart, once holy, or people who had been blessed in this world, yet fell away from the truth and we were disbelieving, disobedient, and were judged for it. In other words, these certain people and those who they lead astray and follow after them are in line for certain judgment, just as the examples we have from the Old Testament. And he gives three examples. The first one is those of the uh, people who were delivered from Egypt by Moses, yet didn't believe and didn't obey, and so were forced to wander for 40 years in the wilderness until they all died off or were destroyed. And Jude writes, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, see how he uses Jesus here, is the same as God? He, he was no longer his brother he grew up with. He was Jesus, the Lord. I thought that's interesting. Not every version of the Bible uses that. Some say the Lord, but it's others use Jesus, and some translations have it. I like this translation. It's, it gives it a power. Okay, Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Um, Hebrews 3 talks about this. I, for time's sake, I won't go over that, but if you want to reference Hebrews 3, 15 through 19. Um, secondly, it was verse 6 in Jude, and it says that angels who did not stay within their own positions of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until judgment of that great day. Like I said, Jude and, and, and Peter were closely tied. Listen to this verse in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, the term Tartarus, the pit, the buso, and, <laughs> I'm sorry about that, um, who did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. These two guys, Jude and Peter, almost saying the same thing, word for word. 
And where did they get this? Where did Peter and Jude get this? Because you don't read about this particular story in anywhere in the Bible. But they got it from a, 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 a non-biblical book called First Enoch, the book of Enoch. And in there, it talks about fallen angels being kept in the prison house until uh, the day of their judgment. And then finally, the third example was Sodom and Gomorrah. So just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulge in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a, per, a punishment of eternal fire. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed by fire and brimstone. They came down from heaven and destroyed the town and killed uh, all the people and, and everything. And so that's kind of what he's referring back to. They were destroyed by fire and they're kept for judgment until the everlasting judgment of eternal fire. So that's it. That's about as close as you'll get from a hellfire and brimstone sermon from me. This day with just a mention of this. So to sum up what, what Jude is saying here, those who pervert doctrine, who get away from the faith, the truth, the gospel, once for all delivered to the saints, who reject the truth, who deny the Lord, and are living lives that reflect their perversion, they face a frightening future. So we need to stick to studying the Bible, learning what it says to do and what it says to believe and live in obedience with sound doctrine. In doing so, you'll be fine, just fine. <laughs> Especially since we are kept and led by our Lord Jesus through the Spirit in the power of God the Father. Well, I'd like to close, I'll close each of these three weeks with the closing two verses of this book of Jude, uh, called a doxology. So let me close with this blessing to you. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now forever. Amen. So, we are blessed, and we are kept, and we are preserved, and we want to be a preserving, keeping influence in our life especially with what we believe in the faith. So thank you for joining us at CBV today. I pray you're blessed. Have a blessed week. It's a wonderful life in Jesus. Amen. Bye-bye.